So I decided to start a podcast. I basically just want to throw a spotlight on people that I really admire and believe have a lot of value, knowledge, and wisdom to share. And the first person who came to mind for me was John Thomas. John Thomas has been a friend and mentor of mine for over a decade now. He is a licensed psychologist with over 30 years of experience working with anyone, whether going through life transitions or in need of updating old beliefs, narratives, and stories that aren't really serving them anymore. A main area of expertise for him is working with adolescents and young adults struggling with ADHD, transitioning from high school to college and college to career. He is the founder of the ADHD College Success Guidance Program, where he utilizes his own experience and struggles with ADHD to develop an experiential residential college readiness success training program and an affiliated academic coaching model. Additionally, he is the author of Thriving at the Edge of Chaos, Making ADHD a Superpower in College and Career. You can get this book through his website or through Amazon.com. This book serves as an organizing and integrating textbook template uh, for his training and is a practical and pragmatic guidebook, which I believe is extremely powerful, whether you have diagnosed or undiagnosed ADHD, or even if you don't identify with ADD or ADHD, and you're just looking for more focus and clarity in life in general. In this episode, we dive into what ADHD is, common misconceptions around it, tools and resources for anyone struggling, whether you have ADHD, you have trouble focusing, having trouble with clarity in life in general, your teacher, educator. We also dive into belief change, how we develop these stories and narratives that we carry around with ourselves and how to transform these stories and beliefs to reach our fullest potential. And let's face it, in this day of dopamine-driven media, we're kind of all on the spectrum of ADD. And I think it benefits us all to look at how and where we're harnessing our focus and energy. So I really hope you enjoy this episode. Let's dive in. I'll just follow your lead. You tell me what to do when. All right, cool. So, yeah. Um, so, what, what, uh, how did you get interested in the field of psychology and in, in, in helping people? Um, whoa, let's see. Um, and, um, at an earlier age, back in my late 20s, um, I felt like I was crazy. I'm a, I'd been through a tremendous amounts of trauma in my childhood and um, and, and young adulthood. And so um, I, I thought there's just got to be a different way. There's got to be some way of resolving and getting through this. And so uh, I started reading and uh, decided, well, hell, I'm going to go do, do this thing called therapy. And back back then it was at the leading edge of um, of the the personal um, or the, the human potential movement. And when we began to think that, well, therapy's too good to be wasted on just crazy people. And I thought, well, I'm crazy and, and I want to be better too. So um, I went through much, began my, my own journey and through uh, therapy and resolved uh, lots of the trauma. And most importantly, found a path forward in dealing with some of the other issues related to that. Um, so the therapy was one of the, the one part of the journey and then working with other sort of um, uh, groups, you know, uh, wellness and, and treatment groups. And somewhere in there, I thought, you know, I started feeling like, well, I'm not crazy anymore. I'm feeling pretty good about myself and the world. And, and I simultaneously thought, well, uh, I think I could, I could really enjoy doing this for other people. And so I began studying at, um, did, began grad work at George Washington University and finished my, my master's and got licensed, began practicing and, and continued on for my doctorate and was involved in some research. And, and um, it, just, it just blossomed into my calling for me. It just, it fit in a lot of different ways and brought a sense of meaning and fullness to my life, and it continues to. 
Um, my plan is to work. I uh, used to tell people I want to work doing this work till I'm 83 years old. And now I just say, well, I'm, I'm going to work till noon on the day of my funeral. So <laughs> it's something I'm very passionate about. And I love and enjoy doing. Yeah. It, so did you start specializing in ADHD from the time you were in school or? Well, yes. Um, I, somewhere along my master's, um, I, I resonated. I started remembering my own roots in college of uh, the first year where I screwed up royally did what a lot of people you know between you know 40 to 50 percent of uh, people who have ADHD fail their first semester of college and so I, I um, resonated with oh yeah that part of the journey was really hard and and uh, I, I started moving finding myself moving in the direction of working with people with learning disabilities and ADHD in fact um was a project director and then later principal investigator for a research project um, at George Washington during my doctoral work that focused on those, you know, young adults with with uh, learning disabilities and ADHD. So I had a personal and a professional passion. Right. Uh, yeah. That... <laughs> and would you say that's a, the most prominent part of your practice or it's kind of like 50 50? Um, um, I would say it's a prominent part of it. It's it's um, continued. I have other interests and peripheral areas, and and some of which we've spoken about before. But even those relate to uh, ADHD, uh, I believe. And so, um, you know, when the, if we think about ADHD as a part of a person, the person is um, like a uh, a stone in a pond. There's ripples that that go around them, and they they uh, and you know the ripples go through different parts of their lives and people and settings. And so my work is about working with families and couples. And you know there's people that I've worked with when they were going through um, high school or college that later on come back at some transition in life, some later transition in life. Um, I really feel old when I start working with their adolescent kids, you know, like I began with them. So, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's, it, it tends to focus a lot on ADHD and, and, uh, and the cluster ADHD. There's uh there is the learning disability and, and, um, and spectrum issues oftentimes are part of that as well. So learning disability and ADHD kind of go hand in hand, you would say. Yeah, it, it's they. Um, I've heard it described as a cluster. We we, we have a certain neurological. Um, I don't want to call them disorders because the uh, way of thinking is that they're adaptive. But um, learning and attentional issues and 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 uh, spectrum issues sometimes are all in the you know sometimes uh, um, uh, tick disorders. Um, you know there there's a there's a cluster of them. For example, I had tick disorders as a kid that that drove my mother crazy but um i got through them so yeah they they tend to be in clusters okay um and you would describe adhd as kind of like neurodiversity right um it's just like a different way of um processing information and in, in different ways of learning yeah yeah different uh, very much uh, a a diverse, a different way of uh, experience the world, not just learning, but experiencing the world uh, in many ways, I believe. Um, there's like in my book, I do a, um, for example, um, we have a span of apprehension. There's so much we can pay attention to at any given point. And for people with ADHD, that point is different than, than, um, uh, neurotypical people, for example, a neurotypical person, if uh, they're juggling three objects and you throw them a fourth and they say, oh, I can't do that. Well, their span of apprehension exceeded. They'll let go of that fourth object and keep juggling three. Person with ADHD is like juggling three objects, you throw them a fourth. I can't do that. Well, they all fall. Right. And that's a different way of experiencing life. And I don't know if one's better or worse, but in some situations, it's easier to 
be able to let go of an object and just go back into the work of uh, whatever it is versus dropping it all. But then again, sometimes you need a fresh start and uh, a new broom sweeps clean and all of that stuff. So in different contexts, these different ways of being in the world can be uh, useful or not useful. And you mentioned it's adaptive. Uh, how do you see this adaptive? I came across this idea that it's like a ev evolutionary adaptation. It was beneficial for like hunter gatherer uh, tribes and cultures. Because mm -hmm. um, if you can notice subtleties in the environment, like a, a running creek off in the distance, or like uh, you notice these red berries or like a, a, a rustling in the brushes, you're going to notice food and water resources. Um, Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Or, Yeah, that sounds like Tom Harton's work. Uh, he came up with that idea a long time ago, and uh, it makes complete sense. And there's so many different ways of seeing that. Um, uh, the, remember, uh, the Reverend Jesse Jackson said the world's divided into uh, tree shakers and jelly makers. And, uh, and people with ADHD tend to be the tree shakers, you know, and and the, it's it's adaptive because they they um, serve the uh, the tribe or the community that they're in. These are the people that would be wanting to look in new directions and try new things. They may be the ones that even actually eat the red berries and, and you know probably discover well hey uh, they're poisonous and don't eat those. But um, despite all that, we you know we're still around. Right. Um, despite our impulsivity and hyperactivity. So there needs to be some way that that is adaptive. And I, I do believe it, it was functional both for us individually and collectively as a society in early days. And even now with the rapid, uh, you know, complexity of our societies, it still seems to be adaptive and it's requires some tweaking and it requires some, understanding of ourselves as people with ADHD and how we interface in a good way in, in this system uh, and in a good way that's fulfilling to us. But I still believe it's adaptive even today. It seems adaptive uh, for certain career paths. I feel like um, I feel like entrepreneurs, you're juggling a lot of different things and uh, you're kind of an innovator. Um, it seems very adaptive that way. But as far as like the typical uh, industrial society and culture, it, it seems um, like it kind of can hinder or, or hold us back and in, in fitting in education for the industrial system. Um, mm, yeah, that's a, that's a, <clears throat> boy, that's a, that's a big area um, to dive into, but I, I would think in my personal experience, I'll, let me go with the other side of it. Um, I remember going through college, um, I, I, I had to work uh, to make money to get through college. That's the only way I, I came from. Uh, my family was too poor to, to put kids through, through college. Um, my mom said, always said, well, I'll just homeschool you for that. Um, and that was just her way of saying, well, I, we can't afford it. So I worked in factories. And um, there was one factory in particular I found myself working one time. I had to work a summer and a semester. I actually worked a whole year there. And it was like, that's what made me believe in hell. Because I have nightmares of that place doing the same thing over and over and over. And nothing challenging, nothing stimulating. And, and it was awful. And and uh, the only thing that brought me any hope in life was that I was continuing to take classes night uh, during this time. But uh, I got into a deep, dark depression. And it only lifted some time after I got out of this, this factory setting that just um, was the opposite of ADHD. Um, and so we see that... Um, people with ADHD drawn to careers where there's a variability and uh, and stimulation and challenge and and uh, ways that we sort of need to learn to move ahead 
and um, in the book, I you, you recall the section on a particular type of motivation that I think drives a lot of people with ADHD. I call it uneasy in the harness, mm-hmm. which um, <clears throat> in early early times in in life, like uh, childhood, adolescence, it looks like oppositional defiant disorder, but it's just a drive to, I want to sort of run my own agenda and I don't want to be told what to do. I want to, you know, I can take only so much of that. And, and that drive is a sort of a desire motivation to create um, your own agenda in, in a way that's sustainable in, in, in our, uh, in, in the world of work. And for many people, that's entrepreneurship. It's like creating your own company. So unsurprisingly, you see lots of people uh, in you know, CEOs and, and uh, startups that are got folks that are that have ADHD. Right. Yeah. I think to your your point, yeah, they're drawn to that. You know, a lot of people are, with ADHD are drawn to particular fields. And it seems like the the education system uh, makes it very challenging for ADHD people. Um, at least when I was in school, obviously. It's been a while. I don't know how much the system has changed and how much education or training there's been for teachers and educators as far as ADHD. Um, have you seen that improving? Uh, well, yes and no. Um, yes, we're de- uh, in education developing all sort of neat cutting edge kind of technologies for learning. Um, <clears throat> and no, um, in the pandemic, People are we're having trouble implementing them because a lot of school is online. But um, even even with um, online learning, some of these um, wonderful forms of education are conducive not only to ADHD students but to all students. Um, there's one um, a flipped classroom, uh, just in time learning. Um, they're they're um, for example with we use those in our our training where instead of me doing a lecture, like if you've been to the workshops where I'll just give a presentation and then people talk it through and then we put it into action, I just do a video and send it to them. They watch it. And then there's um, um, part, of the, um, uh, part of the just-in-time learning is that they're given, within 24 hours, they're given a survey, not a quiz, but a survey that just sort of assesses where they are and you know how much they understand the concepts. And so then the information is designed to, um, you know, the, in the presentation, the follow-up presentation, it's based on where students are so that it's not just throwing it out there, um, assuming everyone's read the, the literature, understood it, or, you know, watch the video in this case. Um, and then it's, you know, it's processed in groups where people talk it through. We and Even on the screen, you can go into rooms and Zoom um, and and people are interactive. What What's happening uh, now is the opposite of that. I hear college students describe sitting through lectures where they just watch this screen and they hear this lecture and then they, you know, give, they have assignments they do, but they're not interacting with students. Right. So, um, and, and, you know, they're isolated and lonely already. And this is even more so because there's a whole room full of people there online, but they're not in, they're not engaged with them. And high school kids are, you know, uh, there's one kid that, uh, that describes by the end of the day, he's crying in frustration because um, it's like an hour, 15 minutes or hour and 30 minutes and then a 15 minute break hour. And it's just listening to a teacher and, and doing these like assignments and, and that's it. And, and um, no interaction. Of course, kids, a uh, lot for a lot of reasons, they don't, um, they just have an icon up there. They don't have their cameras on. Right. So, so people are increasingly isolated there and people with ADHD naturally need something that's more engaging and stimulating. They need the interaction of other people and, it's damned hard for kids to just drag themselves through this, uh, whether it's high school or college. Yeah, and I, I, I can't so, imagine. Like, um, same here. I mean, any student, but ADHD in particular, it's even harder. Yeah. So. 
yeah, some of my coworkers have uh, had to bring their kids into work and I just see them in, in passing, just sitting there in front of Zoom. And I just can't imagine, I'd be completely zoned out and yeah, it's gotta be tough. I zoned out in class with all kind of people around me. I can't imagine just being on the yeah, screen. Yeah, same here. And then the stimulation that's needed. Of course, kids are popping on different screens. I'm and, sure. Uh, and, and that's pulling them away from the learning. Right. Uh, but, yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I think in, the, in earlier years as a child, people who are less sensitive or less understanding of ADHD, they may see this as like behavioral problems, but then as you transition to adult, it can, you can really thrive and it, you can see it as a superpower. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of people have this belief that it's a inability to focus. And I wouldn't say it's an inability to focus. It's just, you're hyper-focused on things that you're really passionate about and interested in. And you have a really challenging time focusing on things that are that you're just disinterested in um, yeah yeah pretty much i mean we're focused somewhere in our waking moments and and so it's not a matter of being unable to focus it's a matter of being able to intentionally bring our focus to bear and that requires for a teacher understanding adhd and 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 building uh, the education process with that in mind. And for individuals, uh, there's a responsibility that we bring to understanding ourselves and how we learn and how to do our own accommodations when it doesn't happen. And um, that's kind of how I got through school, I believe, um, in undergrad. In graduate school, I was fascinated. I never had to worry about it. It's kind of like I didn't have ADHD in grad school. I did in undergrad. But... Uh. And, and so the, um, the, and then the other part of it is that there's where there's hyperactivity. Well, yeah, you couple that with, you know, they're paying attention to all kinds of stuff or stuff that's interesting and they're bringing this energy to it. That's it's, it's I mean, it's gotta be crazy making to teachers. Oh yeah. And for my part, I was pretty hyper as a kid and um, we, we had more structure that was, uh, you know, like corporal punishment, things like that, that kind of helped keep, bring a fear motivation. But despite that, I still, you know, was just this bouncing off the wall kid that some teachers loved and some hated and and all had to endure. But as I got older, it, you know, the like many of us we with ADHD, I, I uh, sort of matured out of the hyperactivity but also more than anything, learn to treat it as an energy that as I focus it, it is a superpower. It's a gift. So right. that at this point in my life, I appreciate having that kind of energy and, and uh, even more so um, find a need to focus it to make better use of it because right. it's not the same level of energy I had when I was like 12 years old. So, right. I kind of see it as like having an internet browser up and just like one too many tabs open and you're like, all right, what's important here? What am I doing? What's the task? What am mm -hmm. I trying to accomplish? Um, you know, that's interesting. When I studied hypnosis, Ericksonian hypnosis, one of the ways you hypnotize people is basically to open too many tabs. And, you know, when we're focused on too many different things visually and aud or auditorily, a part of our brain goes to sleep. And so with ADHD, I, we like to think we can handle more of those tabs before we go to, go to the uh, exceeding span of apprehension. But uh, there's still a limit. To yeah. And so you guide uh, young adults. Um, through their college path and in career early career path. And do you see a lot of trouble choosing a direct career path? Um, kind of like bouncing among a lot of different ideas. I know that's been a struggle for me, um, choosing a career path and then the belief that, you know, maybe I can't make a living um, from my passions and my true interests. And I, I have to settle for something more mundane or something that I'm less interested in. Um, 
you know, a lot of beliefs from, you know, culture and teachers um, that my interests aren't able to be monetized very well, but also my beliefs that I took on is being learning disabled and ADHD and that I'm going to struggle with a lot. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if that's something that you've you've noticed. Um, yeah, that's another deep dive. There's a, so many ways of thinking about that. Um, <clears throat> one is that we're in a, a a time where things are rapidly in in expanding and developing, and the kind of uh, careers that uh, a student who's a freshman in college now. By the time they get out of school, there's going to be careers that they couldn't even dream of then. So, you know, it's like I say, you're trying to hit a moving target while you're in movement yourself, because this is a time of life where people are developing real rapidly and trying to kind of stay on some sort of a target is, uh, you know, that's going to lead somewhere is difficult. And one of the things that I try to do is come up with language, a common language that helps um, us to be able to talk about ADHD and, and the world and ourselves in it and the tools we need to, to find our way in, a, in, in this journey. And so a way of thinking is like, uh, we think job, career, and calling. A, a job is just something you do for money and it's, it's how you make a living. A career is that, plus it reflects our interests, you know, the things we like and our temperaments, just sort of how we were born into the world. Like, do you like to be in one place in front of a computer screen or do you like to be moving to different locations and or outdoors or indoors? So so the career reflects some of, of, of that. A calling is all of the above. Plus, it, it incorporates our, our values and our, our purpose, our life mission. And so an ideal is that we've, we have a calling because we're not only making a living, but we're doing something that's interesting and it matches our temperament. And also it's a lot, it has meaning. It has a, it, it's, it's some, it's not really work because it's something we we're, we're born to do, so to speak. And so finding our calling is really difficult in a changing world, a changing uh, psyche in young adulthood, and then, you know, trying to weave all this together, all these elements together and find uh, what, what will work, what will sustain us and financially. It's no easy task. So unsurprisingly, um, probably more people are in a career than in a, in, in a calling. Um, many people uh, up in, in this part of the world, you know, say, I'm just in a job. I do this because it, I get good money doing it and that's important right yeah so, I, I feel like a lot of people are are in careers and they're they're satisfied they're fulfilled they're they live happy lives and i wonder if a lot of adhd people are like no i have to find my calling i have to pursue that and that's something i've definitely identified with i just i struggle with depression and lots of frustration just working jobs and um it, it's like I, I have to be constantly pursuing my passions. Well, that's the dilemma. It's like <clears throat> until we find a calling, and I believe ideally for everyone, it's important to have a calling, um, and especially so for people with ADHD. But people will sometimes piece together um, just like, you know, when I was younger, I didn't have a full-time job. I had three part-time jobs, and they all kind of, they, they all worked, you know, and I got by that way. Um, and so in some ways, it's like you can piece together a fulfilling uh, life of vocation and avocation, like have a career, but find even greater meaning in other outside activities like right. you know, music or, you know, you remember I used to keep bees. That was, that was part oh, yeah. of a very, very strong purpose with me for many years. And so it's, Generally, the happiest people I see with ADHD are those that have a varied life. They have a lot of activities they're in, in addition to what they do for for a uh, career or even a calling. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy the direction things are going. Like 
people can make a living playing video games now. Who would have imagined that? Like even like 10 yeah. years, 10 years ago or so. Or TikTok, you know, you get enough right. followers, you know, you make a post. That's what Morgan's doing now. I don't know if oh, he's doing yeah. this stuff, but no. follow him on TikTok. He's, his passion is, has always been animals, as you recall. Right. Yeah. But, um, he, he's, uh, sort of narrowed down in, in time to reptiles and, and those uh, extraordinary amount about reptiles and has begun raising and selling different kind, mainly crested geckos and, um, Oh, I can't even, I don't even know what all. And oh yeah, then he got into insects. And, oh wow. And there's certain kinds of insects that people want that will they'll buy, like um, I don't know, like domestic uh grown or domestic um uh, born black widows are like fifteen dollars, you know, crazy oh, stuff wow. like this. And he loves it. And that's awesome. So while he's doing his other kind of training, live training, he's, he's getting certified as a yoga instructor and um, some other areas. <clears throat> uh, this this is what sustains him financially, but it's, wow. it's almost a calling at his. But he's only nineteen, so yeah. Um, who he is in twenty years would would not be happy with just doing that. I don't think he would. He will probably, you know, as long as he follows his passion. It'll be some larger sort of um, whatever experience that interfaces with where we are as a world at that point. So, right. Yeah. That's awesome. So, yeah. Sounds like he's fi- finding his niche calling. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And he's into the breath work. And that's how I learned about Wim Hof breathing was he, he led oh, us cool. on Wim Hof session. So. I don't do the, you know, he jumps in the pond when it's 30 degrees, but I don't, I don't do that part of the Wim Hof. So. Yeah, that's pretty challenging. I, I got to psych myself up for that. Sometimes I'll jump in some Alpine lakes or some snow melt creeks, but. Whoa. Yeah. I got, I got to get myself like super pumped up before I do that. <laughs> but Maybe when I was younger, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It, it's a rush though, for sure. I'm bad. Yeah. Maybe I'll try it someday. Mm. Um, I'm curious if you see any correlations with ADHD people with uh, like uh, self medicating. I know that I'm pretty prone to drinking a little bit too much caffeine, um, especially uh, if you're not prescribed um, medications for ADHD. Um, and do you think that can help or hinder? I, I find sometimes I really think if I'm going to focus, I'm going to you know drink a bunch of coffee and I'll be hyper focused and get stuff done. But then it actually hinders me because then I'm like kind of all over the place. Well, yeah. Um, uh, in fact, I, I believe in coffee. Um, uh, pediatricians now are prescribing that for like they used to do it in, in, in early days, hyperactive kids. That's the term they use for it. They, the docs would prescribe two cups of coffee a day. And um, now, uh, and then they went back and forth. Well, it stunts your growth. It's not good for kids. And now um, pediatricians I talk to will prescribe coffee for for kids with ADHD for several reasons. And, uh, you know, the antioxidant and, and other effects of it in addition to the... Um, you know, how it helps calm and focus kids with ADHD. The caveat, though, is that uh, it, you know, if you take it with a stimulant medication, it, it potentiates it and it can kind of get a little bit into overdrive. Yeah. Uh, too, too much of a useful thing. Um, but yeah, to the point of self medicating, um, p- part of ADHD is uh, anxiety and depression are often. Uh, co-occurring co- uh, with ADHD for some reasons that, that kind of makes sense as you look into it. But when people don't understand what's happening, they may spontaneously try to self-medicate. And that's um, usually doesn't end well. Um, and in fact, uh, there's a higher correlation in uh, substance abuse among people with ADHD. That's a, that's a known correlation. 
um, for for lots of reasons: the impulsivity, um, the, the the drive for stimulation. There's there's lots of explanations for it, but that is a correlation that exists. Um, and once an ideal is once once we understand first, you know, some people are undiagnosed and are self medicating, but once we get a sense of what's going on and start learning more about ourselves and and discover what what we can do um then you know there's less chance of the my in my experience there's there's less chance of the um, self-medicating in a negative way going on uh, <laughs> have you come across any correlation with trauma in early childhood with adhd or like it, how does adhd manifest um I've heard it can be inherited and I've come across ideas that early childhood trauma, uh, you're trying to block out certain events um, and it kind of, I don't know if this is the right term, but kind of rewires your brain to be kind of scattered almost. Um, mm -hmm. Well, um, there's um, what, what tends to be the research I come across is that it, it, it tends to be genetic and it typically comes through the father. It's passed to the father. Um, in my case, though, my mom had ADHD, um, and I used to, I used to say, "Well, my mom gave me ADHD because she was like always talking and going on and on and on." And I learned to just tune her out, and and that's where my distractibility and lack of focus came from. Um, well, now I don't believe that. I think I had that going on, but. Um, certain factors in our environment can exacerbate uh, ADHD features, and trauma is certainly one of those. It it just puts a whole added layer to uh, ADHD, I believe, and can exacerbate some of the worst symptoms of it. Um, part of uh, you know the exaggerated startle response, like. If I'm sitting here working on the computer, <clears throat> Pam walks in the door and says, hey, I, I go, <laughs> I jump out of my skin, you know. I said, don't creep up on me like that. And she said, I just walked in. But that's um, that's part of ADHD. And it's also part of post-traumatic stress disorder. So there, you know, there's, if you've got some of the, you know, that I, that hyper-focus and, and startle response going on with ADHD and PTSD, I mean, you're screwed. Yeah, you know, somebody walks in and says good morning. You freak out. You know, it's like right. So I've worked through much of the trauma of my earlier years, but I still got that ADHD. I'll be like way focused, and it's like nothing ever exists except what I'm writing on or what I'm reading. And if somebody walks in, and and they just show up. They just sort of like uh, you know, it's like something from a Harry Potter movie. You know, <laughs> they just. They they manifest right there beside you. It's a it just freaks me out. Yeah. Uh, so going about um, belief change, uh, I think we can take on a lot of negative beliefs that don't really serve us in in our highest potential um, from educators and potentially family and just society in general about ADHD and how can we go about shifting these beliefs. Well, so <clears throat> so you speak to belief change kind of like in that context of what our common experience, which is, well, you find somebody has a limiting belief and then you work with them to update and change that belief. But I think belief change happens uh, earlier than that in, in a negative way. It's like we don't come into the world believing that we're, uh, you know, not college material or that we're not enough or we're deficient or defective humans. That's something we are, it's a belief that gets installed along the way. And so that's the original belief change that is, you know, just really sucks. You know, cause we, we, we come into the world with all kinds of possibilities. Yeah. Um, there's, you know, the, we, we bump in, each of us have our own limitations that we bump into, but not in a belief sense. So um, a lot of uh, a lot of times people with learning issues or, or uh, ADHD issues will be given messages 
um, that are just real clear and direct are sometimes that maybe not intentionally, but the, right. you know, teacher may not intend to um, send a negative message to a kid, but the impact is that that kid gets that message or they infer it and they don't question it. It's not clarified. And over time, it sort of sticks. It's like my way of describing it is when the way we create emotions is that there's an experience, something happens and we evaluate that experience. And that's where emotions come from. And in this evaluation stage, first, there's a story we tell ourselves. Like first time my uh, high school math teacher said, well, John, um, don't worry about college. You're just not college material. The story I told myself was, well, what a crank, man. I don't, you know, I don't like she's saying that. But over time, I kept hearing it. I kept hearing it. And it became more a narrative. And then to the point that, you know, I, I went... Um, at one point, I, I, I said, you know, I think I probably want to go to college. Everybody else is. And and I was talking to my mom, you know, and she said, well, why won't you? I said, well, you know, Miss Klein said uh, I'm not college material. And, and you know, and, and well, she'd already said it many times then. Quit it. You know, I don't know why she picked. Uh, maybe she had a group of people she was saying this to. But I was certainly felt like the only one in this particular class. And um, so she, I, I remember she said, well, let's, let's talk to her and see what, you know, what, what we can figure out. And, and yeah, she told my mom that too. And neither my, neither my mom nor my dad had ever gone to college. Ms. Klein had. And so um, she was the expert in my mind, in my parents' mind. And, you know, so that became a belief, not a story, stories we talk ourselves out of. The other day, I heard a siren out here oh, a couple of months ago. I ran and I thought, "Oh shit! There's a somebody got hurt. That's a it's an ambulance." And and I get to the window, and um, well, it's a parade. So, you know, ambulance, somebody's hurt created fear. Um, a parade created joy. See, so we can always refine story, but once it's down in a belief, you can't talk yourself out of it. It's stuck. It's um, it, it's it's a truth that's self-evident. And so it requires a different approach to break the concrete of that. Now, in times, in t over time, like for me, I was just stubborn and shit. So I kept going through, um, you know, I pushed my way through undergrad and and um, I, I, um, I would do as much work battling that negative limiting belief as I did doing the schoolwork. So I... Basically, undergrad was double time for me. It was double effort. And by the time I got to um, uh, graduate school, I started, I was more open to believing in a new way. I'd had different experiences in life and had some successes. And um, after the first semester or two, I was really starting to think, oh, yeah, I can do this college stuff. And I can even excel at it. Well, there's about a 15 year period between when that belief was installed and when a new belief emerged. And it was just life experience and stubbornness that caused me to prevail. Um, and we're, there's fascinating new technologies we have now that more rapidly help people to update their beliefs. And, um, um, some of the uh, Ericksonian hypnosis work is really good with that. There's a process uh, called EMDR that's used in trauma that I've found actually breaks up old beliefs in a neat way. <clears throat> and um, some of the um, some of the new uh, uh, you know like ketamine assisted uh, therapies and other psychedelic assisted therapies are known or, or you know that they will probably discover that will help break up some of the concrete of these old limiting beliefs and empower people to see themselves more for who they are in the world. But yeah. all these neat technologies are, are, some are online, some are emerging. And so it's a very exciting time. Yeah. So I think a key would be um, just taking small steps to build confidence and build evidence of new beliefs that you want to install, would you say? Sure. 
Uh, that's a very, very important first step. Uh, and an equally important first step is to be able to identify what that belief is that's limiting you and understand that it is a belief and and it's it's a part of you. Just, I mean, you need to embrace it and, and own it, but that it's not based in current reality. And any ways that you can find to have that conversation with, with yourself and with other people and let that guide you in engaging in, you know, like you say, small step at a time experiences that will, um, you know, that will, will change that, help you evolve that belief. Um, it's sort of like if I'm afraid of snakes and somebody says, here, pull this snake. Well, that's not going to help. But if no. I sort of like look at a snake in a book, you know, and then, you know, maybe see one in behind glass and the successful approximations that lead up to it uh, are the same sort of thing that we want to do with our experiences to consciously um, update a belief. So, yeah, to your point, it's kind of some small steps are also a good way to do it. That's what I could work on is the snake one. Uh, we had a snake incident last summer. Ooh, really? Yeah. My friend and I went uh, camping down in Southern Colorado and we uh, just got to the campsite, got our tent set up. We were all psyched for the the long weekend and we're walking around the campsite and uh, my friend got bit by a rattlesnake. Oh my gosh. It was terrifying. Yeah. Thankfully we were pretty close to a park ranger's office and they called an ambulance and yeah. So she stayed a, a couple of nights in the hospital. Did they have to hit her with anti-venom? Yep. Wow. Any, uh, how did she, how did she do? Did she prevail? Okay. Did she, did any? Yeah. I'd say it was at least a few weeks of recovery. Um, she had to use like a, like a walking stick. Uh, yeah. That was, yeah, that was terrifying. So now I'm just paranoid. Well, that's a useful paranoia. Yeah. You know, sure. if, you're, if you're scared to walk in, in, you know, to your bathroom and you're, you know, doing like some people do in Australia and look under the sea, well, that's a little bit unuseful. That's too much of a good thing. But if you're watchful when you're out in the in the wild there, well, that's 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 good. That's yeah. Fear. Yeah. And thankfully, it was a baby rattlesnake. There's a misconception that they release all their venom all at once because they can't control it. So it's more powerful. But uh, they actually release, they do release all of it, but it's actually less of a dose than an adult. So I think that helped. Um, but it also didn't help uh, because it was such a small snake that, you know, we didn't see it at all. Oh my. Yeah, it just like popped out of the ground real quick and just, and then back down. Oh, but you found the snake though, right? No. She saw it for like a split second. I didn't see it at all. Oh, so uh, and uh, that because they want to know the, what kind of snake it is to be sure and to give the right anti venom. Right. Yeah. I think they went back and looked for it, and they never saw it. Like the park rangers. Oh, and generally, uh, you can rattlesnakes. They're not. You know, have copperheads, which would be the only other poisonous kind of. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah. But. Snake. uh yeah, thankfully, where I'm at, uh, we're at high enough elevation that we don't have rattlesnakes. But um, if I drive down to town, there's there's plenty down there. So I'm I'm good at hiking up here, staying up here now. Okay, where where are you now? <laughs> I'm right outside Boulder, um, in in the foothills. Uh, so I'm about 25 minutes outside of Boulder, um, just west up in the foothills. But yeah, right around Boulder, there's lots of rattlesnake activity. Um, oh, gosh. But we're far enough out and at enough elevation that it's it's not the right climate. <coughs> wow. Well, I'm glad you're safe where you are. Yeah, yeah, me too. Um, oh, yeah, the thing I was going to circle back to was um, – a lot of ADHD people say, you know, they can only focus on things that they're hyper interested in or something that they're passionate in. And I feel like a lot of people would say that, like, you know, people who aren't, don't identify as having ADHD. Um, so how do we make sense of that? Is the brain just kind of wired differently for ADHD, ADHD people? 
Well, yeah, <clears throat> oh, our brain's wired in all sorts of ways um, that we <clears throat> that we act uh, sometimes in total opposition to. <clears throat> For example, my brain isn't wired to uh, get out and run unless something's chasing me. But um, I run because uh, I want the benefits of it. And it's sometimes it's real hard on a cold day to get out there and do it. Uh, and I prevail. And I'm not the only one. Lots of, a lot of us do this sort of thing. So a way of thinking is that, yeah, we have a, a predisposition, a, a set in a certain direction and away from certain things. And that doesn't mean we can't do. It, it means it takes a, another step. For example, <clears throat> to focus on something that is important to our future well-being, like, you know, like a college course or, um, you know, learning some particular task um, requires motivation. And when we bring motivation to our focus, that intensifies it. You know, like in, um, oh, there's, I'm, I'm trying to think of what that, that computer game is that um, some of, uh, um, was it Fortnite? Yeah, Fortnite. You, you don't see any kids with ADHD when they're playing Fortnite. They're all glued for hours because they're motivated. It's compelling. It's grabbed their attention. So the way of thinking is that when we learn how to motivate ourselves, our, we can enhance our focus. We can be more intentional and, and uh, choose and sustain uh, our focus. But motivation is not a, it's not a simple thing. I mean, I can break it down into simplicity. There's, you're either uh, motivated by fear or by desire. And within that, though, there's many different types of motivation. And I believe people with ADHD have sort of unique or nuanced forms of motivation that are some of the ones that we you know, I talked about earlier, the uneasy in the harness. And, um, and there, there's a, you know, half a dozen more that I talk about in the book. But when we can understand how how we are uniquely how when I understand how I'm uniquely motivated, and I learn how to bring that motivation to something that that I deem important in my life, more likely that I will be able to sustain my focus because you know like I'm more desire motivated. And I've got this junky office here that that really needs a going through. And uh, say, what's in it for me to do this? Well, you know what? I'm going to think a lot clearer and I'm going to use a lot less time finding things. And uh, it's in my best interest. And uh, now that I'm saying it, I'm kind of getting some juice going around organizing my office. That's how desire motivation works. And I mean, just for me uniquely. Um, and I don't know, I find that people with ADHD tend more toward being effective with desire than fear motivation. Although we, you know, from my case in school, I was more, had more fear motivation directed at me than desire. Yeah. So it's a yeah. different way of thinking. Yeah, I think environment's huge. I'm like borderline OCD about that. Like I have to keep my space clean and that just really helps with focus and creativity. Like just even mm -hmm. simply making my bed and then just like doing a quick cleanup. And sometimes it's like, uh, I don't feel like it. And then I just like throw in some music and just like kind of amp up the mood and just get everything cleaned up. And it just totally changes the whole day sometimes. Mm -hmm. So you found something that shifts your, your environment auditorially. And that's no surprise because, you know, you've always been drawn to sound and sound therapy and, and music. Yeah. So it makes sense. That's a part of, how you bring yourself to the world in a motivated way. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, also going back to belief change. Uh, one thing I really liked about your mm -hmm. retreat was the carpet work. Um, I think that brought belief change to a more tangible, physical kind of visual <coughs> uh, process, which I really enjoyed. Um, can you speak to like kind of summing up how, carpet work, what that looks like? Yeah. Um, 
there's a a lot of that. It well, it has its basis in two areas. One is the Ericksonian hypnosis, and the other is a a field uh, called psychodrama that um, has been around since the 1930s. <clears throat> and it, in my judgment, it tends to be it, it appeals more to people with ADHD because we like to be doing rather than you know just hearing about. We like to be involved in it, and so. Carpet work is a, is about uh, in general it's it's about setting up in you know scenes that um, are incomplete in our life or or are not functional like um, for example one of the ways of changing the belief I had that I'm just not college experienced would be to set up that scene with my my uh, high school math teacher and rework it somehow can't change what happened in the past, but it isn't about changing the past, it's changing my perceptions of myself um, as a result of that past. So that's a way of updating beliefs is to kind of working through and uh, I'm reworking the scene and bringing some kind of resourcefulness to that point in time that I have now that I didn't have back then. The other is uh, there's a walking belief change process that's um, uh, that's more like the Ericksonian hypnosis approach that um, thinks of, it, it, if you think about uh, belief change, we, we go through a uh, sort of a predictable process whenever a, a belief is updated. <clears throat> and I described from high school to grad school, this 15 year period, that there were stages in which I first became um, open to um, to disbelieving that maybe I was wasn't college material, and I I can't became open to disbelief of that original belief, and um, in time it it became something of a oh like we call it the museum of old beliefs. I, that old belief I was ready to just put it in in the uh, museum of old beliefs and just let it go, and. From that point, I became open to believing something different. wasn't sure exactly what it was, but in time, what evolved is that, well, yeah, I'm a, I can, I can do this stuff, and um, to the point, and that belief evolved to the point that where I'm standing there getting hooded from my doctor, and it's like, oh yeah, I'm a scholar, <laughs> I, I can do this. I, I got, I'm, I got some good sense here. Uh, and fortunately for me, after uh, sort of the crowning glory of that, after the after I got hooded from my doctor, I went back for my 20 year class reunion and my math teacher was there. And I'll always like to tell this story. I, I introduced myself as Dr. John Thomas. Yeah. And it was kind of like an in your face moment. It felt good. But that's awesome. See, that didn't change the belief. Belief was already changed. Right. Yeah. It was sort of like the icing on a well fake cake yeah for sure so the thing of through time those are the stages i went through what we do in the walking belief change is sort of a process where people anchor themselves to these different pieces and move through it in a way that sort of speeds the process up i mean it speeds it up real fast you do an an hour or so or two hours sometimes what took years 15 years to do and so Uh we're creatures of our beliefs. We're, we're going to actualize what we believe, um, whether we know it or not, that tends to draw us. Like people who want to quit smoking may have a belief or a self-concept type of belief that says, I'm a smoker. As long as they have that, it's going to keep trying to actualize. So when we shift that belief, especially a powerful one like a self-concept, we begin to actualize that belief in the world. That's what we manifest and how we show up. So yeah. very powerful stuff. Yeah, yeah, the carpet work was pretty huge for me. I really enjoyed that. I, I still do. And I always get a piece from that. I'll do my own work. There's always something I'm wanting to, to work on or update. Yeah, yeah. and likewise, uh, doing the kind of psychodrama with the, the Mankind Project as well. Um, yes. because I, I worked on kind of different pieces within that context. Um, and 
that see that and that that's the that's that's a belief change when we go back in like mankind project is a is a very profound uh excellent example of, of uh, carpet work the embodiment of carpet work or psychodrama and um back in the 30s when this the founder marino was you know first developing it i don't think he ever had any idea that this is how it would be used to help men understand something of who they are in the world and what their what their mission is and uh you know what their calling might be and uh, their passion their purpose so yeah. and and how to resolve all the the awful trauma and garbage and negative limiting beliefs that gets in the way, you know, that that continue from their past to hamper them moving into this um, compelling future. Yeah, yeah, that's good work. Yeah, yeah, I need to get uh, back involved with the Mankind Project. I think I'm going to seek out an I group. I'm not sure what that looks like nowadays uh with the pandemic situation but they're all online now they stay um i don't know any of them that meet in person but people go go to the website and you can get hooked up in an i group it may not be somebody next you know in boulder it may be somebody across the country but right now it doesn't matter and i'm still meeting with my i group and they're still powerful as hell work going on online Right that's here awesome. on the screen. So. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I feel like that's crucial work. Um, I, I think we're a key thing we're missing in our culture is kind of rites of passage, and that's kind of how I see the Mankind Project. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, yeah, as a culture, we don't. The closest thing we have to it is a bar mitzvah uh, for. Uh, uh, for boys, uh, uh, Jewish boys and bat mitzvah for girls, but um, um, we don't do like traditional cultures. You know, boys to men was our uh, attempt to do that for adolescent boys. And um, there's some some related spinoff kind of groups to Mankind Project that I've heard of, but we still, I think Mankind Project still is the, is a, is the best avenue for that. Yeah. Story. There's another one I found recently. It's called Sacred Sons. I think uh, you'd really enjoy checking that out. Um, I, I want to get involved with them pretty soon. They're doing online stuff, and they also do uh, in-person retreats, I think mostly out in like Joshua Tree area, but I think it kind of moves around the country. Um, but I, I think they're up to amazing stuff. It's kind of more of like a, even more of a tribal kind of influence on what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's pretty profound work. I'll check it out. Yeah. Um, yeah, I feel like, uh, we've touched on a lot of amazing stuff. Um, I think a big thing is, uh, in our culture is embracing cognitive diversity. Um, if you have mm-hmm. any key takeaways as to parents or guardians of people with ADHD or, educators, teachers, how they can better embrace uh, neurodiversity? Um, well, I'm, I think that's an area where we're, we're doing far, far, far better than ever before. And um, in some ways, um, in some ways, it's overdone. In other words, some kids are accommodated where they're too much. We'll say again. They're too much. It's like padded walls too much. Like, yeah, they're, um, they're, the scaffolding in their life is too high. It's like, you know, kids that, um, are given every sort of, uh, accommodation, extra time and so forth. And then they get away to college and they're not doing that in college and they don't know how to deal because they haven't learned how to deal without the accommodation. And so the scaffolding needs to be lowered to the point that by the time they're out of high school, that they're ready to do some of these things on their own. And so that's an example of how we're doing too good a job of some of this work in terms of accommodating. But the work of uh, neurodiversity, I believe, needs to be that, yeah, you you know, you're, you're, neuro, you're diverse, you're different, and you're going into a world that may or may not accommodate for that. So how do you learn to interface? I think 
I think that's the pendulum swinging back now is that we're going to be focusing more on that um, or we're going to need to because yeah. it's it's like um, it, people need still need to show up to work. And yeah, it's hard to get out of bed in the morning. It's hard to be uh, on time. It's all of these things that um, may be difficult for ADHD or explanations, not excuses, or they're not going to, they're not going to give, we're not going to get a pass for that in, in the world of work. Right. Um, so it's, it, it requires us to become attuned to our neurodiversity and, and attuned to how we interface with the world in a good way. Yeah. Awesome. Great stuff. Um, and part of that accommodation, Tim, is about picking the field picking the work, the kind of work that we do. For example, wow, I remember at one point they uh, made me foreman in this uh, factory I worked in and we're talking about putting me on a track to uh, upper, you know, to management, managing the factory. And my God, can you imagine? Oh man, that way. So we need to know ourselves in the world of work enough to know the greatest accommodation, which is where do I put myself? Where do I find myself in the world that's more most fulfilling to me? Right. And that's a hard job. It's it's not easy work and it's ongoing work. Yeah. And I think it takes a lot of self-awareness. And then going back to the belief thing, um, we just carry around all these subconscious beliefs. Um, and then we have to develop self-awareness to unveil those subconscious beliefs. Um mm-hmm. I don't know if you have any key practices for that. I think general mindfulness meditation practices um let's see wait a minute <clears throat> ask that question for uh, kind awareness of, of the beliefs yeah subconscious i drifted, I drifted for a moment my adhd mind drifted <laughs> and i lost what you said so say it again squirrel uh, <laughs> uh unveiling our kind of subconscious beliefs that we carry around um I, I think we kind of stumble with things and we're not even sure why we feel stuck and why we're struggling so much, but there's these subconscious beliefs at work. Well, any kind of meditation kind of helps get us closer to what's going on in the, in the depths of our mind. And that's where beliefs, uh, you know, hang out. And um, in fact, one of the, one of the meditations I want to work on with you uh, was uh, is a you know the soundtrack for a, a meditation for identifying limiting beliefs and awesome is it a story a narrative or a belief and what is that belief and you know when did it when was it formed and how did it make sense and you know the ideal would be to have a real um in-depth kind of a, a, a meditation where people would gather lots of information yeah. about this and that would be a good way to that would you know like in a workshop setting would precede the work on uh, belief change awesome and as well as where is it you know how does it make sense but also what happens in the world out here in the future when you have a new belief how will that be a good thing how could it be a negative thing so right we want to make sure it fits into the ecology of a person's life right yeah that's huge so yeah, meditation is a good way to gather a lot of that stuff. Yeah, I found meditation practices and journaling to be really helpful for me, um, mm. among a lot of other things. I mean, there's so many approaches, and we're we're learning a lot more now. It just seems to be a, a track that's kind of blowing up right now. Um, float tanks, sensory deprivation, uh-huh. and then uh, psychedelic assisted therapy as we mentioned before. Yeah, it's a new awakening of the human potential movement. A lot of people, myself included, blame Timothy Leary for interrupting that. (laughs) And this medicine should just be uh, okay for everybody to use recreationally. It's a medicine. It's a powerful medicine. No, this is uh, this is not for fun. This is for something important. Yeah. Go smoke pot if you want to have fun. Right, yeah. Although that stuff's so strong, it's just, I can't. I oh, it, 
it knocks it's me insane. down. I, I yeah. Do yeah. I've heard the the old timers, the old hippies talk about it and they're like, yeah, it's just not the same anymore. It's like hippie speed now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the THC levels are up to like 23% now. And then people are taking dabs. I don't even know yeah. anything about dabs really, but just like hyper concentrated. Well, whenever I smoke pot around people, they use me for a commercial. I'll have what the guy on the floor is having. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, speaking of which, have have you seen any issues with cannabis uh, and, and ADHD? Like, sure. Yeah. Um, my way of thinking is that um, pot uh, can be a um, Pot can make ADHD worse when used, uh, depending on a person's tolerance and their frequency of use. Um, there's people that I know that use it multiple times a day, and it, it impairs their motivation and their ability to recall and sustain focus. Um, and there are occasions where I know people who use it when they're in creative, um, in, as a as a creative aid, um, like a sativa type, uh, that tends to be bring um, a lot of of clarity of thought, creativity, motivation in some ways. Um, but for some people, sativa just gives them a panic attack. And, yeah. And they, you know, so it's um, you know in the levels of strength that the stuff is these days and and it's even in dc where it's legal or you know in your state where it's legal you really don't you can go read go to where's weed and and read about the different brands they're they're offering and okay it's an 80 20 uh hybrid sativa indica hybrid maybe it is maybe it isn't you know yeah. it's, and what they describe everyone responds differently right so, yeah I think with ADHD, it's it, it's another case of the importance of self awareness and and being able to be real clear and honest with yourself. I know even when it was weaker, um, pot in college was I had to get to a point where my roommates and I got together at the end of the semester <laughs> and looked at our crappy grades and said, "Well, are we going to smoke pot? Or are we going to do college?" And we voted, and and uh, one guy left because he was. He wanted to do pot, and uh, we just stopped smoking pot. Did yeah. better. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can definitely see running into issues with it. Uh, maybe I, I have a bias, but I feel like sometimes it, it can help me um, focus and, and get stuff done. Um, definitely more on the creative side of focus. Um, mm -hmm. But sometimes just like mundane tasks, like, you know, cleaning up the house and chores and stuff. It kind of oh. uplifts my mood and uh, just gets me going. Um, wow! Yeah, I don't know. Well, see, so you're understanding yourself and the and the and the substance and how it works. Um, I was always looking for something as a sleep aid, it, you know, especially in the depths of the of the early parts of the pandemic, where my caseload was so large, I was not, you know, I I couldn't. You know, I, people were in need and I couldn't say, no, I won't. So I'll find a place for you. And I drove myself to burnout, which is you'll read about in the article. Right. And I was trying to find some way of disconnecting and sleeping better at night. And every variety that was given to me would be like I would stay up all night long tripping. It yeah. was like I was doing mushrooms. Yeah. And I've tried to use it as a sleep aid, too. And it doesn't work because it actually... It gets my brain going more. And then it's like, I yes. want to stay up. I want to research. I want to work on creative stuff. I want to draw all night. And it's, I can't go to sleep. Whoa. See, there's a usefulness to that. And, yeah. and, and for mine, in some ways too, it, it, it probably, there was a usefulness of that, that maybe if I did it in the daytime, it'd be all right, but it wasn't a sleep. <laughs> yeah. it, it was something that to do it, I'd have to go off for six hours or so and just be in a contained space doing nothing. Yeah. And see, so there's two differences in how it res how I respond and how you respond. We both have ADHD. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I will say though, like sometimes I go off on these tangents of 
researching and reading stuff. Um, but I, I can't say how well I'm retaining the information. I've heard uh, to uh, recall information, you have to be in the same uh, like kind of mental state as when you um, took on the information. I don't know if that's true. Well, it's there's some truth to it. It's like, you know, like if you stay up um, <clears throat> all night long uh, cramming for an exam and then you go to sleep, you're in a different state and it's state dependent. So don't go to sleep. Just you need to stay in the same state. Uh, that may be true, but um, I think it varies. Yeah. You know, because uh, I know it could, it, part of ADHD, part of learning disabilities is difficulty with uh, transferring information from one context to another. And so that might be as much a part of it. You know, it makes it context dependent in some ways. But as we think about it, no, yeah, you know what? I need to take an extra step. And there's there's ways that, you know, to take something I learned in this context and say, wow, I wonder what it'd be like over here. And that's part of the creativity that comes with things like, you know, microdosing or, or uh, it, it helps activate regions of the brain, theoretically, that are not typically uh, activated. Yeah. So, um, I kind of there's a, I, I'm fascinated by what can come up with some of this research with the ADHD uh, person and and psychedelic assisted. Uh, right. Therapies. Yeah. Um, have you tried CBD? Uh, yeah. Like. Um, yeah, it seems hit or miss for a lot of people. Some people don't notice anything. I feel like it's pretty subtle most of the time. Yeah. It, you know, I tried that as a sleep aid and it didn't, you know, it's probably about like melatonin. You know, yeah. It's pretty subtle. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I'm fascinated with what, um, well, you know, I, that's often a different subject, but, the, you know, the some of the stuff in Poland's book about, the uh, default mode network of the brain and uh, oh, yeah. how um, uh, hallucinogens affect that. And, you know, the, the chaos, you know, if we got too much rigidity in our brain, it's about helping to undo that. But if there's too much chaos, like with a psychotic person, that's why hallucinogens are contraindicated for that. Right. So I'm wondering, with ADHD, we're a combination of rigidity and and uh, chaos, and so I'm I'm real I'm fascinated by what we're going to learn about you know specific to ADHD in this field. Yeah, but there could be some good stuff come from it. I think so. Yeah. Useful stuff. Yeah, I feel like we should do another talk just on that. Uh, yeah. Yes, I I'm down for that. That'd be amazing. Yeah. And then, you know, the stuff you're doing with sound therapy, I found like the one thing that worked better than anything for me of any of the meds or whatever is, um, or, or pot for sleeping is a sound bath. Yeah. I, on one of the meditations, I came up, there's a sound bath. It's like 15 minutes long. And sometimes I have to replay it a few times, but it, it'll uh, invariably kind of gets me into a more of a sleep state. Yeah. Yeah, I've wondered why that, if that's why I'm so drawn to to sound and sound therapy, uh, possibly my ADHD. It's like uh, just trying to sit down and meditate in silence. My thoughts are just going, going, going. And <laughs> sound just draws me right into the present moment. And then also as a sleep aid too, falling asleep, uh, I'll just lay in bed forever. Just My brain is just, it can't shut off. And then I turn on the sound and I just, I'm in the moment and I just drift off. Yes. It's a, it's a powerful tool. Yep. We got common ground on that one. Yeah. Agreed. Um, I mean, I can be completely exhausted, but I'll just lay there. My brain will just not shut off until I turn, turn on sound. Yes. That's a good interrupter. Um, a real positive interrupter. Um, gosh, I got two disjointed questions coming up. One